The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. As always, it is good to be in the house of the Lord with our family in Christ. Friends, we are going to worship in this time, and you know how it starts. We're going to start with prayer. I would invite you to pray with me. Oh God, we come before you today because we are yours. Your grace, your mercy, your might, and your grandeur require that we respond in praise. So God, we have gathered today to do just that. We confess that we come with all of the worry, the distractions of our lives and world swirling in our minds and hearts, and we ask, O oh God, that in this time, in your time, we would set those things to the edges of our minds that we might be focused on you in our eyes, with our ears, and in the posture of our hearts. That in this place, at this table of grace, in your word read and proclaimed, and in your songs of praise, we might be equipped for your service. We ask this to be true through the working of your spirit, which we ask you to send upon us now. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Please stand if you're able and join us in singing. Great is the Lord, he is holy and just. By the power we trust in his love. Great is the mercy he proves he is love great is the lord and worthy of glory great is the lord and worthy of praise great is the lord now lift up your voice now lift up your voice great is the sing it again and you'll know it a little better this time great is the lord he is holy and just by his power we trust in his love great is the lord he is faithful and true by his mercy he proves he is love great is the lord and worthy of glory great is
be seated. Please. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of, breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with you, which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always pres uh, preserve, persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me, to make known with the boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I must speak. And may the Lord add his blessing. To the reading of his word. Amen. Good morning. What are we here to talk about? Um, the armor of God. The armor of God. Good job. Somebody was listening. Okay, let me open up my Bible here. <clears throat> Can anybody name the armor of God? Okay. So we have fit your feet with the gospel of peace. Okay. All right. And what else? Can you please stop? Sit down on your bottom, please. The shield of faith. The shield of faith. That's right. The belt of truth. The belt of truth. All right. So we're using the Roman soldier at the time as an example, right? And so they wore the belt of truth. Soldiers had, the, their belt was really important because what did their belt hold? Their hand. Their sword. Their sword and their shield. Okay. <laughs> and then the breastplate of righteousness. What did the breastplate guard? Where do you put your breastplate? Your heart. That's right. Guards your heart. It protects um, the spiritual life of a Christian, right? And then you fit your feet with the gospel of peace. So soldiers <clears throat> had heavy armored uh, sandals that gave them traction and security in the heat of battle, right? So then the shield of faith, Nikki, you got that? The shield of faith. <clears throat> faith in God's promises deflect the and extinguish the lies of Satan. All right? And then we have the helmet of salvation. What do we, what do we protect with the helmet? What's our brain, our mind, right? So, the battlefield of the mind. 
Um, <clears throat> spiritual warfare is what that is going to protect you with. Okay, so we got to put on. So can everybody like stand up and put these things on? Put put your pretend belt on. Come on, put your pretend belt on. Where's your belt? Where's it go? Around here. Okay, and then your breastplate. Put that on and strap it on. Right? Your feet, your shoes. Put your shoes on. Grab your shield. Hold it in front of you. Right? Come on. Your helmet. Your sword. Right? The word, and what is your sword? What is it? The word of God. What is the word of God? That's right. It's the Bible. Yeah, this is our word of God. This is what guides us. Thank you. All right. So why do we need these things? Stop touching. Back up. Hmm? To protect you. To protect you. Protect you from what, Asher? The devil. From the, yeah, from the devil, right? From his lies to give us peace so that we can... So we can stay strong in God's word and be his warriors here, right? All right, let's pray. Thank, thank you, God. Thank you for this spiritual armor that we may be, that is being used, but the, we know that the war is already won. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
We come this morning giving thanks and rejoicing, yet in the time that we sit within this church house, all the world's problems will most likely not be solved. When we walk back out of these doors, we will return to the aches and the pains, to the groans and the worry, all of that stuff that weighs on our minds and our hearts. Thankfully, we will not go out there alone. We did not walk in here alone. We have a God who hears the needs of his people, who hears the prayers of his people, and we have a people who lift each other in prayer. So friends, we're going to have our time of prayer. You will be able to pray silently, then I will lift a prayer on our behalf. Let's go to God. O oh God, you are our maker. All that was created or is or ever will be is the work of your hands, yet you bend your ear to hear the cries of your smallest children. O oh God, for such closeness, for such goodness, we give you thanks and praise. God, you bid us to gather here just as we are, bringing the big problems of our world and the individual problems of our lives and lay them down at your feet. Not because we are worthy, but because you are good. So God, who made us, we ask you to make a difference. Make a difference in bodies that are failing and hurting. Make a difference in those in need of healing. Make a difference in the turmoil and the strife within the hearts and minds of those walking forward into an uncertain future. Make a difference, O oh God, in those whom we love, the names resting in our minds and hearts the ones who need healing, the ones for whom healing may not be so. O oh God, give what is needed, for they, like we, are yours. O oh God, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, you redeemed us, all that has been redeemed and all that ever will be redeemed. O oh God, we come before you now proclaiming we are indeed in need of your redemption in need of your redemption when we sin and fall short, in need of your redemption when we fail to go where the Spirit leads, in need of redemption for the ways in which we make messes between ourselves and our sisters and brothers. Oh God, forgive us, make us new, make us better, we pray. Oh God, we need your redemption in our relationships and in our situations, for the way that things are broken just because they are, for the way in which we feel surrounded and beset on all sides. Oh God, may your redeeming grace, peace, and love give exactly what is needed. 
God, we need redemption in the communities and in the nations. Where everywhere we look, we see hurting, we see war, we see brokenness, violence, and selfish action. Oh God, by the power of your gospel and the empowering of your people, we pray that there too redemption would occur. Oh God, through your Holy Spirit, you are our sustainer. You have sustained us from the first day of our life right on through to eternity. Oh God, sustain us now. Sustain us with your hope when things appear hopeless. Sustain us with discernment where we wander not knowing where to put our feet. Sustain us with wisdom. Sustain us with perseverance. Sustain us by your sword and shield, O God. O God, you hear our praise, you hear our need, you hear our confession. Act upon our lives according to your will, for there is nothing better, nothing more sovereign, nothing more gracious, and nothing more merciful than your will. We ask that it would be so through the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Finally, we are at the end of the book of Ephesians. We have finally looked at our last lectionary text for that epistle, and I dare say it's probably the crowd. I'm sure a great good many of you know the armor of God. You are familiar with that passage. Odds are, if you grew up in a church, at some point you had that poster of the night and the labeling in your Sunday school room. Went to a very strict private Christian school. We had armor of God play sets, but on pain of death, we were not allowed to whack each other with the swords. Can you imagine how well we listened? Not very well. As a matter of fact, I had to look today because when I got to this church, there was an Armor of God poster in the kitchen of all places showing a kid with pots and pans and a spoon as the sword labeling the Armor of God. I don't know who brought it here. It was here when I got here. I don't know where it went. It's not there today. Funny how things just move in a church. No, it's a a passage we love to teach the kids, right? Because if we're being honest, sometimes it's hard to keep their attention with all this Bible stuff, right? And sometimes there's things in it, things that are good, but they just don't quite appeal to kids, you know, like make sure you're going home and honoring your mother and father. They love that one. The admonition to be meek and humble and and patient and perseverant and all of those things for kids are, are, are kind of hard to make them applicable. Sometimes don't sound very exciting, but take up your sword and your shield and your helmet and your belt that they get because deep inside of every child they want to slay a dragon it's in there that urge that is innate to our being to be a part of an adventure to slay the dragon and save the day that resonates with kids and it doesn't stop resonating when we grow up because let's be real after an endless amount of turn the other cheek and the meek will inherit the earth sometimes we wonder Is Christianity really telling us to be that much of a doormat? Are we really looking at a meek, passive existence in the midst of all that is going on in the world? A few passages that still kind of hook us. A little bit more rah-rah, suit up, gear up, go to the battle, win the day. It's a beloved passage. And I will say there's so much in there. Paul does a beautiful job with his alliteration, with his comparison of the traits of faith to the armor. But friends, I will say so often that's where we stop looking any deeper. We make this passage just a list of ways faith protects us. The way in which faith is the shield and the spirit, the sword. But friends, there's a lot more going on here. When we take it in context as the final part of Paul's book of Ephesians, you're going to see that he's tying into every part of the book that came before. Paul is reminding them of everything he has told them. He is also reminding them of the why that he told them. This passage is more than just a list of traits of faith and how they keep you safe. It is more than just a 
Patton-esque speech to the troops telling them to storm the trenches. It is literally Paul saying, here's what I told you and here's why I said it to you. But I too have fallen into the pattern of so often when I've handled this past this text in the past, focusing only on how our faith keeps us safe, how it makes us bomb-proof, fire-proof, and life-proof. And because of that overemphasis, this was the passage I just knew was going to get me fired as a youth minister. Many of you have heard this story, but some of you have not. Trying to teach this passage to teenagers, I was sure, had ended my ministry career. Because the time came to teach this passage, I was thinking of how to do it well and creatively. And I thought, you know, to these kids, I'm going to remind them, there's a lot of things that we put our faith in to keep us safe, right? In a way, your phone is a piece of armor. If you break down, you can reach out and get help. But it's only good while it's plugged in. It's only good while it has battery. Your friends keep you safe from insecurity and loneliness and sometimes from making bad decisions. But all teenagers know their friends are fickle and the cause of as many of their problems as they are a remedy, so ultimately that's not your greatest armor. And parents are, of course, a higher level of protection for the things of life, but even parents aren't perfect, and the kids loved hearing that. So ultimately escalating to the only thing that ultimately makes us fireproof, bombproof, and lifeproof is our faith. And to lay all this out, I thought I would bring some cool props, and here's where I got into trouble. I said, you know, we've got to have your basic protective equipment, so some soccer shin guards and cleats, that'll be easy. A bicycle helmet. Then a little bit more, right? So some martial arts sparring gear, the the little light foam gloves and foot pieces. Then a little bit heavier than that, I escalated to the tournament armor, you know, with the face mask like you see on the Olympics, like big chest protector. But then I just kept going because I said, Dad, can you help me with some equipment? And he says, I absolutely can. So I also brought a soft police officer's vest, the kind that are made out of just thick woven Kevlar. Then I brought out the cool one. It is a beautiful 90s vintage SWAT vest that had the thick Kevlar collar, the flap that hangs down to your knees. It came with a matching black Kevlar K-pot helmet, and it even had one of the earliest ballistic ceramic plates. That's important for this story. And I set it up there, and then the PA de resistance was literally parts of a functional bomb suit. With the plexiglass visor helmet to vent the blast, this thing is that thick and like 20 pounds. It was awesome. And I brought a couple other pieces of the bomb suit, and so I lug all this gear in ahead of time, and I arrange it on the air hockey table. And the kids come in, and I'm telling them about the different levels of where we put our faith and what keeps us safe. And a kid puts on shin guards, and yeah, this is dumb. And the kids put on the sparring gear and the tournament gear, and of course they start punching each other, but I was prepared for that. I knew they would. And I cleared all this with my pastor, mind you. And then they put on the soft body armor, and they're they're kind of punching it and feeling of it. They're like, man, that's like a real bulletproof vest. How cool. Then they get to the big one with the plate in it. And I put it on a kid named Reed, who's a relatively large boy, and he puts on this heavy vest, and he puts on the K-pot, and he is standing there, and I'm, I'm talking about it and trying to tie this in with the lesson, when up pops a 15-year-old boy who says, that's not real. And I said, no, no, it is, really. No, there's no... And I say, no, nah, man, don't do that. That ceramic will hurt your hand. And this thing's really old. And he goes, nope, I'm going to punch it. And we're going back and forth, and I think maybe he'll walk up and check it, right? Maybe. No, but then the worst thing happens. His little girlfriend says, punch it, baby. <laughs> I want to see teenage boys do something dumb, have the girls talk them into it. So he says that, and he jumps up, and he kind of takes a half-running step towards the kid wearing the armor. And he doesn't check it. He doesn't jab it. He throws a right cross from the bottom of his feet and his immortal soul. This kid punched with everything he had. And I heard the tink, and Reed just barely went, punk. But at the end of the tink, we heard a sickening. And as he pulled back his hand, a knuckle had migrated. 
It was the most obvious, most severe boxer's fracture I had ever seen in my life. The kid turns green and he just slumps. And friends, I've lost the room of youth many, many times. But none like that time. Do you really think we were getting to any of the lesson after that? No. I just tried to keep them contained till it was time to leave. I went and talked to the pastor and said, I might have messed up. And explained it a little bit, but then I loaded up all my toys and, and went home. But then I watched the phone, and sure enough, this young man's mother called me as I knew she would. And when I picked up, she says, can you tell me, I'm having to edit this conversation as I go, can you tell me what my sweet beloved son was doing at the time he sustained this injury? And I said, yes, ma'am, I can. Um, it really was part of a lesson. I had every good intention. It was cleared by the pastor, and, and then he punched it because his girlfriend said he could break it. And she goes, oh, he really did that. I said, yes. She said, when he showed me his hand and I asked him what happened, through the tears he said, I broke my hand because I didn't think Josh's armor was real. And I thought, if that's what he's willing to confess to, what really happened? And the truth is probably something much worse. So when I told her, no, really, we brought a bulletproof vest to talk about stuff, and he punched it and broke his hand, she goes, that's all I needed to know, thanks. And I could hear him being chewed out in the background. <laughs> So now this passage makes me twitch a little bit, beloved passage as it is, but I realized in that moment I had done what we always do. I had stayed on the surface. This is how faith protects you. This is the barrier faith puts between us and the wiles of the world. But friends, there is so much more to it than that. And I didn't bring any props because I learned my lesson. And after that, Dad will never let me take any of his toys ever again. So now we look at this passage and we can see that there's a lot going on. First of all, Paul starts the passage off with finally. And if you've ever heard me describe Paul in this way, when Paul says finally, it's kind of like when a pastor says in closing, it means nothing. Paul says finally because he's turned the corner to his last point, to his final admonitions. That does not mean this is a closing. This is a listen up. I'm about to give you the summation. I'm about to give you the big ticket item that you're supposed to take away from this. And then he starts tying in with everything else he has said. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. He tells them to buck up, be strong. Remember, when he prayed for them back in chapter 3, what was his number one prayer for them? To be strong in the Lord. He is tying back in. Remember how I didn't pray for you to have it easy. I prayed for you to get stronger. So be strong in the Lord. Put on the whole armor of God. It is interesting that about two lines apart, he says put on the whole armor of God twice. Almost as though he is reminding him, them all the things I am going to tell you, all these different component parts are not a buffet you can pick and choose. Faith, righteousness, truth. They're not things you can come in and go, I want this piece today and that piece another time. Paul is saying, put on the whole suit of armor because if you want this thing to hold up, if you want the mission to work, if you want this thing to keep you, you have to put on the whole shebang, not just the parts you like. Then he reminds them that... This is so that they can stand against the wiles of the devil because then he says something very critical to this passage. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is spiritual in nature. Against powers and authority and darkness and principalities and all of these cosmic struggles, but also deep down individual spiritual struggles. What is one of the main themes of Paul's entire book been? Put aside your differences, church. Put aside the squabbling and quarreling between Jew and Greek and who's this and who's that. Put that stuff aside and today you can see it coming to fruition. Saying, oh, you like to fight, you like to argue. Good, because we're at war. But it's not with each other. The reason Paul is harped on unity is not just because Paul wants some church of people who get along saying kumbaya and never have a difference of opinion, because that church ain't existed and never will. Paul is reminding them, you're not supposed to fight with each other because you are not the enemy. 
You are not just part of a who is right and who is wrong. You are not part of a tit for tat. You are part of a cosmic spiritual struggle between all that God is bringing to be in His coming kingdom now and forevermore and every single force that stands against it. Satan and the darkness and everything else. This is Any of this stuff is little compared to what you are actually a part of. Yes, church, you are at war, but it is not with each other. Also, notice he doesn't tell them that they're at war with the non-believers out there. He doesn't tell them, save it for the enemy outside the door. He reminds them their struggle is with powers much higher than anything they can ever see or experience in their daily lives. Then he gets into the individual places, and it's brilliant in its analogy, but it ties in with so many other parts. One, this would have got their attention because he is describing a well-equipped Roman centurion. He is describing the tier one top guys of their day. Their local constabulary wouldn't have been geared out like this. And so he is reminding them in a way, you each are fully equipped for whatever the fight brings. In the same way that those Roman legionnaires seem to have an endless supply, seem to have endless logistics supporting them, seem to have all that they need and then some, church, you have exactly what you need to carry out the mission. Also tying into those prayers in chapter 3 where he said, appeal to God according to God's richness who is able to do more than we could ever ask. He is tying back in. God is rich. God has an endless supply. God has equipped you for everything that will be asked of you. In the same way that a Roman centurion is issued every single piece of equipment they would need. He talks about the belt of truth. Going back to how many times has he said so far in this book, tell the truth, put away falsehood. Tell the truth, put away falsehood. And I love that it is the belt because, you know, what does a belt do? It keeps your pants from falling down. Keeps you from looking like a fool, especially for some of us gentlemen who have a rather linear build from heels to the back of the head. The belt keeps your britches up, but more than that for these centurions, the belt was the very basis of their outfit. It was what everything else anchored to. It is what held up their weapons and tools and equipment. The belt was the center. So it's beautiful that he goes, truth is the centerpiece that holds this all together because this gospel is true, the church is true, and if you're living in truth the way I have told you to, those who see you out there know your word is true and know you're good for it. Truth in every level is the centerpiece of this outfit, of this armor. And it goes back to reminding them of I have told you Be truthful. Be true. The gospel is true. Your word needs to be true. I've told them to put off falsehood at every step of the way. Now he's saying all that truth stuff wasn't just because I need you to tell the truth. That truth stuff is because it is the belt that holds up the rest of everything for the struggle to come. Then, of course, he goes into the breastplate of righteousness. Now, he has, for a couple of chapters, talked about what righteousness looks like. Remember, that was the one that sounded like he was bouncing off every philosophical corner in the ancient world. Right? But also it was all commonly agreeable. Don't steal, work for it. Don't be drunk, be sober and filled with the Spirit. Don't lie but tell the truth, work hard. Don't be angry and sin because of it, but be anger and keep your wits about you. He is going through all of these things of righteousness, and here he brings all that up. Not to say I was just giving you rules to follow because you didn't look like you had enough rules. No, strive after righteousness because it is the breastplate that protects your heart and your lungs. Also, it's interesting that it's contrasted with the shield of faith because the, it's a beautiful alliteration here because the breastplate of righteousness guards what is most important but is kind of passive. It just sits there and takes the incoming blows, much in the same way that righteousness, a good reputation, striving to put sin to death, protects us when we're not watching. Protects our reputation, protects our witness, protects our reputation even behind our back. But the shield of faith, that would have been known to them in the Roman military machine. Your shield was not just for protecting you, but it protected the man on your left. And you were in turn protected by the man on your right. 
The shield was what you would turn towards the incoming problem. The shield is what you would put up when the arrows blotted out the sun. The shield was what you moved. In the same way, friends, I don't know how many times I have seen y'all pivot and lock your faith together to protect one of our own who's gone down. I don't know how many times I have not quite had a deep enough well of faith and could tell that it was the shield of the Christian next to me, their faith that was supporting me. It's a beautiful analogy, that breastplate to shield, and he, he does it well, and I love it. But then he gets into the lace up your sandals, with whatever would prepare you to go and spread the gospel of peace, this is the part where he gets a little weird. He says, lace them up with whatever you need to put on to go spread the gospel. But not just gospel, gospel of peace, when he's just used all of this warlike, very martial imagery. But remember, what did he say way back in the first week we looked at Ephesians? Jesus is the bringer of peace. Not just He's the bringer of peace, He is our peace. He is tying it all together saying, put on whatever you need to get out there and spread the gospel. And remember, gospel is about peace, but also the gospel is by the one who is our peace. It is a way of both invoking it as Christ's gospel, but also reminding them all of this gospel he has proclaimed to them has been about making peace between sisters and brothers in the faith, making peace between sinful humanity and a righteous God. He is tying all of that in an extreme brevity of words, reminding them what the gospel is and to whom it belongs, and kind of a reminder to them and to us, when the gospel hooks you, your feet should have a hard time sitting still. The gospel should move, and it should move you. Then he gets to the helmet of salvation. This ties in with so many other things Paul says in his epistles, because Paul says in Romans, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In Colossians, he says almost the same thing. This idea that salvation, what it looks like, is a transformed mind. A difference made from the inside out. And then to say that salvation is your helmet that protects your squishy little brain box is his way of reminding them what salvation is supposed to look like. It is a transformed mind. And knowing that your salvation rests in Christ, you are safe from the insecurity. You are safe from attacks on your mind. So he does all this beautiful tit-for-tat stuff and comparing breastplate and shield and belt and boots and all that. And then he gets to the part that we misused, right? The sword of the Spirit that is the Word of God. How many memorized that line as a kid? I know we had to in school a lot. We forget that the sword belongs to the Spirit. Because how often, friends, do we use the Word of God to clobber people who think or act or look or be differently than us? How many times in the history of the church have we taken certain verses and used them like a Louisville slugger to the knees of our adversaries? Plenty. But so often we forget that the way he describes it as a sword is, yes, as something dangerous, as, yes, something piercing, but it is the sword of the Spirit. And friends, we know this to be true because when when the Word of God came alive in our hearts and pierced us to the heart, When the Word became alive and moved you and hooked you, it was absolutely the work of the Spirit. So friends, Scripture is not something to clobber with, I think he is telling them. It is something that requires the training, the skillfulness, the usefulness of a swordsman to deploy. But it is the Spirit who claims it. It is the Spirit that makes it work. And the two can never, ever be separated one from the other. Then he goes into this saying, pray and keep watch. He has told them many times to pray, but so far praying has just been in the context of worship, right? Pray always. You should be constantly praying and giving thanks. But now in reinserting it after all of this battle and armor imagery, he has taken prayer from just an element of worship and made it as vital as battlefield communication. 
It's not just a part that sits on a bulletin. It is crying out for God in the midst of the struggle. It is crying out for further orders in the midst of what we are doing. And so he ties it in with prayer, and he's essentially summed up everything he has told them in one brief chapter. And then he goes into pray for me. That when I have to speak, I will have a word, I'll be able to speak, and that I will do it boldly. Guys, that is one of the most stunning parts of the book of Ephesians. Because Paul is a lot of things. You can call him grumpy. You can at times call him insulting. You would be certainly right to call him brilliant. But friends, struggling to find something to say is not Paul. For Paul to say, pray for me, my church that I started, my church that I've nourished, my church that I am writing to in my absence from jail, pray that I have something to say. I don't know what we are to make of that except for it's a beautiful bit of vulnerability by Paul, reminding them that as much as he is in this paternal spot with them in teaching them, he needs them. He covets their prayers. But also, ironically enough, if you ever find yourself wanting to serve God but struggling for a thing to say, in a situation where you don't know what the right words are, you are in darn good company. Because Paul, on limited time, when he can have the church pray for anything, says, pray that God will give me the words. And then he prays for his own boldness. And he prays saying, or he asks them to pray for his boldness. He asks them to pray for him as he is an ambassador of the same struggle they are a part of, but in chains, is Paul's way of reminding them that their struggle is not confined to Ephesus. The struggle of the church of Ephesus is the struggle of the church in Corinth, the struggle of the church in Galatia, the struggle of Paul in Rome. It is the struggle of all God is doing and bringing about and making his people and his kingdom to be versus everything else that stands against it. And Paul is reminding them that I am still in that fight with you, though I am in chains, but you are not. You are still on the field. Now put on your armor and act like it. It is a powerful ending message to the church. And we would mostly think if Paul did not die immediately after this book was written, it was very close to it. This is one of the last messages Paul probably got out. So there's a lot here. It's a beautiful capstone to that book, but what what do we do with it? Well, one, even though we're a long way and a long time from Ephesus, it absolutely speaks to us. Because is faith still the shield? Is the word still a sword? Is truth still what keeps our britches up? Absolutely. But friends, it speaks to us because a lot of times while we love this imagery, this Lord of the Reigns-esque, take up your shield and sword and go fight for Jesus, friends, we don't live our everyday lives like we're expecting to need a helmet. We do not live our walk of faith like we're expecting fiery darts. Friends, maybe we should. Friends, if faith is a shield, if salvation is a helmet, if truth is the belt that our tools hang from, then maybe we should expect if it was issued, we'll need it. Maybe we shouldn't be surprised when our life, when our world, when culture, when temptation, when anything that stands against us makes it not feel safe or conducive to be a Christian. If we feel like everything in me is tearing away at my faith, if I feel beset by doubts and temptation, I don't think we should be surprised. Because I don't think he would have given us a shield and a sword and a breastplate unless we were to need it. So maybe we should be a church expecting opposition out there and in our own lives too. Friends, I also think it is an important reminder today that yes, the church is in a struggle, but it is not with one another, and it's not even with the lost brokenness of the world. Because Paul tells them the struggle is with the opposite of all of these armor pieces. Your struggle is if righteousness is the breastplate, sin is the attack. If faith is the shield, doubt is the arrow. But notice... The struggle is much bigger than that. So friends, when you encounter lost people, when you encounter doubt, when you encounter temptation, that is not the archer, that's just the arrow. 
Remember that the lost in this world are not our enemy. They are victims too. The arrows of the darkness that stand against God's coming kingdom have rained down on them too as they have on us. The only difference is we have a shield and we have a sword. The enemy of the church is the enemy of the flourishing and well-being of all of God's children and all of humanity. The only difference is you and me are no longer innocent bystanders on the sidelines. The difference is we have something to do about it. And friends, it's a daunting task to think of the church needing armor because life is going to be slinging darts at us, but here it is. And it's a hard lesson sometimes to say we have to put all the pettiness aside and the pettiness even outside the doors aside because we are part of still a cosmic eternal struggle of light versus darkness. It is hard to hear that sometimes. But it's as true today as it was 2,000 years ago. So church, let's take up our armor and not just the pieces we feel like. But good news, I've read the end of this book, and he wins. And we're his, so we will too. Let's go act like it. Amen. Thou the bread of life, you can stand if you'd like to. Here at this table, we are nourished for our journey. Here at this table, we are reminded of what makes us family. Here at this table, we are reminded of the lengths to which God will go to get back His own. Every time we gather, we remember our Lord Jesus Christ the way He commanded His first disciples to remember Him. The night He was betrayed, He took bread and He broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. Take, eat in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Take, drink, in remembrance of me. Sisters and brothers, every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim his life, death, and resurrection until he comes again. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to your table giving thanks for your loving guidance. We give thanks for the armor in which you provide us against the enemy. At this table, we accept the sacrifice of your son, his broken body making us whole, and this cup of salvation washing away our sins. Holy Spirit, guide us in donning the full ar armor of God that we may walk in righteousness, performing the works of the kingdom by standing firm against the enemy and staying strong in the Lord's almighty power. Now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This table is not First Christian Church's table. It is not a Disciples of Christ table. It is the Lord's table. All who seek Christ are welcome and encouraged to partake. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we pass the offering plates, please give with a thankful heart what you can. Thankful that in the blessings that God gives us because we are truly, richly blessed in this life. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this generous body of Christ. We lift up these offerings to you, dedicating it to your work here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Everything we do as followers of Christ is, to a res is a response to the grace of God that moved first. When we respond to that grace by confessing He is Lord the first time, when we respond to that grace by entering the waters of baptism, and when we respond to the grace of Christ by joining with a worshiping congregation. Friends, if you have been moved to make such a confession of faith, the table is open during our hymn of invitation. Go in peace with this benediction. As you go, may God go before you. May you be equipped with the shield of faith, the belt of truth, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. As you go forth proclaiming the gospel of the one who is our peace. Go in peace, church. Amen.